Well, I think the significance of any anniversary, certainly one like the 50th anniversary, is both to have a celebration of what we've accomplished, to think about what we've accomplished, to think about who we are as an institution and how did we get here. But I think even more importantly than thinking about the past, thinking about the future. So how has what we've done in the past prepared us for the future? Uh, how do we perhaps need to refine some of our approaches, some of our emphases, to make sure that we are productive or even more productive over the next 50 years as we've been over the past 50 years? So in terms of birth defects research, every organ system, every major organ system that develops in a human baby also develops in the zebrafish. We've actually uh, found that a number of genes that are known to cause uh, uh, defects in humans, cause hemorrhagic stroke defects in humans, similarly cause uh, fish to have hemorrhages in their, in their heads when you knock these genes out in, uh, in fish. We've gone and tried to understand more about this, this gene pathway and about how these genes work with an eye toward potentially helping uh, people that have defects in these genes or that have hemorrhagic stroke defects to better understand uh, what we can do to help those people. There are several negative outcomes for infants who are born preterm. For example, they are at greater risk of dying. 18,000 infant deaths each year are to babies born preterm. There is a treatment for women who have recurring spontaneous preterm birth. And we did a study and found that if these women are treated at 16 to 20 weeks with a hormone progesterone, we can reduce the chance that the, these women will have a preterm birth by one third. Myelomeningocele is a birth defect in which the spinal column doesn't close properly over the spinal cord. Traditionally, babies who have myelomeningocele, are, their spinal cord is repaired after birth. But we had reason to believe that if we repaired the spinal column in utero, then the brain and the spinal cord would have a better chance of developing normally, and the baby would do better. And what we found was the babies who were repaired in the womb had much better outcomes. They were less likely to die or have shunt placement after birth, and they had less motor disability, and at 30 months, twice as many of those babies were able to walk than the babies who had repair after birth. HIV infection in children was basically a fatal disease, and 60% of children died by the time they were aged two years. And we first found that using one drug reduced the risk of disease progression, and currently we use um, three or more drugs in these children, and we're seeing increased survival into young adulthood. There's been a complete paradigm shift in HIV from a fatal disease to currently a chronic disease like diabetes. Because HIV was a fatal disease in infants, we really needed to find a way to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And in the early 1990s, the only drug available was zidovudine, or AZT. And we gave that drug to the pregnant woman during pregnancy, during labor, and to the infant for six weeks, hoping that that would be effective. And I'll never forget, it was President's Day weekend, 1994, when the Data and Safety Monitoring Board came back to us and said, you should stop the trial. This is 67% effective in reducing mother-to-child transmission, and you should let everyone know that this is an effective therapy. Newborn screening is a nationwide screening program with well over 99% of children being screened. So that represents 4.3 million infants per year. Now most of those infants are perfectly normal and don't have any abnormalities detected by newborn screening. But for those that do have an abnormality, you can institute treatments that can help prevent very severe complications, including intellectual disability, severe disabilities, or even death. The first condition screened for in most newborn screening programs was PKU, or phenylketonuria. And in fact, most newborn screening programs, even worldwide, that's one of the first tests that they usually start. 
It is remarkable to realize that in the past 50 years, we've actually been able to expand newborn screening from that single test for PKU to now 30 different conditions. And that's largely due to all of the research that's been done to help us understand these conditions so much better. So the uh, newest and youngest of our longitudinal cohort studies is Project Viva to look again at precursors of childhood obesity, childhood hypertension, and early indications of the metabolic syndrome in children. We've learned, uh, for instance, that uh, leptin levels in utero determine obesity later in life, that the lower the leptin levels, the more likely by age three a child will be significantly obese that uh, babies who are born by cesarean section have twice the rate of obesity at age three than babies who are born vaginally. And we've also learned that very early introduction of solid food before four months of age leads to a very surprising six times increase in the rate of childhood obesity by age three. With some of our basic foundational research, we're able to uh, assess uh, the prevalence and incidence of abuse and neglect, and other kinds of uh, relational issues that might occur within a home. So looking at the family dynamics, how mom and dad interact with each other, how the parents interact with the children, and how the siblings interact with us, uh, with each other, helps us to really understand what that dynamic is in the family. Because we start with our basic foundational questions, what is the prevalence uh, and incidence of abuse and neglect, let's say, for example, in families that are experiencing poverty who are at or below the poverty level? What are the underlying mechanisms uh, of poor child outcomes, uh, especially children who might grow up in these kinds of contexts? So having descriptive studies or studies or epidemiological studies or basic behavioral and biobehavioral research studies that give us answers to those questions then gives rise to the, the array of intervention possibilities. It's estimated that approximately 80% of African-American women and 70% of Caucasian women will have fibroids by the age of 50. Of those, only about a quarter or 25% have symptoms. The work that we're doing here at NICHD, I think, will have uh, innumerable effects on the reproductive health of women, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. One of my colleagues, Dr. James Seegers, for example, has a fibroid tissue bank, and he offers tissue specimens to researchers across the globe, and so supports the research of uh, investigators, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. So the overall goals of uh, rehabilitation research at the NICHD are to improve the function and quality of life for individuals who have suffered illness or injury of all kinds, including traumatic brain injury. BrainGate is a multi-electrode array um, of tiny microelectrodes, which are directly implanted into the uh, cerebral cortex, to the outer layer of the brain. These electrodes can record signals from individual nerve cells, and they are processed by some very sophisticated computer algorithms uh, to allow uh, patients to actually control external devices uh, uh, by using the signals from their brain, by actually thinking about doing something. DT MRI provides information about uh, primarily about wiring in the brain, the white matter, the nerves that traverse the brain. It can provide information about uh, clinical conditions uh, such as uh, autism or schizophrenia, things that have been very difficult to analyze or describe uh, using conventional imaging methods or even genetics. Um, it provides information about the viability of a fetus in utero and the, the health of the mother and allows us to look at the brain structure from womb to tomb. What makes our intramural research program unique is that it doesn't necessarily focus on a single disease or a single system. It is focusing on human development. 
we are uniquely positioned within uh, one of the largest research campuses in the world, next to a wonderful clinical research center, where we can see this basic science being contacted right next to where the patients are. And so we can translate these findings immediately to clinical applications. Now, the NICHD mission is broad. It encompasses all of development from basic biology through translation medicine to, through clinical trials. It includes pediatrics, obstetrics, rehabilitative medicine, as well as basic science research and demography and behavioral research. NICHD actively works cross, with cross collaboration, both within the institute, across different branches, as well as outside the institute to other institutes agencies, and other professional societies and organizations. One of the many areas about the NICHD that I am particularly proud of is our commitment to health equity. We know that there are health inequities in terms of length of life, the quality of life, the different rates of infant mortality and preterm birth, childhood obesity, and diabetes, to name a few. But our research is peeling away, layer by layer, some of the underlying biological and behavioral reasons for these health inequities. And as the research looks more closely at the concept of developmental origins of health and disease, with an emphasis on the role of the environment, we're likely to have great success against these health inequities and move towards an optimum health for all Americans. Well, the possibilities are great across all of the areas of our mission. Um, there are different kinds of possibilities. But what they have in common is that we have some new scientific research tools. That we, that they're just opening new doors of, of exploration for us, and doors of exploration that we think will be satisfying to walk through, but also in doing that really will give us new tools to prevent disease, to be able to look at using the developmental lens we always have, to be able, for instance, to get real with the idea that the child is father of the man and mother of the woman, that to really understand how early life influences, even back in pregnancy, have a lifelong impact on people's health and well-being, and to use that knowledge in a way to really improve not just health of children, but health of all individuals.